In this video, we are gonna be talking about a thing of nightmares, the life at the ocean depths. So here are some of the key concepts that we're gonna be going over in this um, slideshow and video, and you can come back and check those out and pause it as needed. But a long time ago, the old school idea was that in the deep sea, it was completely an inhospitable place, that it was way too cold temperature wise for anything to live that there was tremendous pressure. Um, and just to be really clear about that, at sea level, you experience about 15 pounds of atmospheric pressure per inch of your body, but go down just 33 feet in the water and suddenly you're experiencing about 30 pounds per inch on your body. Then at 3,300 feet though, you're getting 1,500 pounds per inch well, at 35,000 feet, which some of our oceans are this deep or deeper, you are experiencing 15,000 pounds per inch on your body. That is like bone crushing amounts of sea pressure. And it's thought that nothing could survive that. Also, things were in total darkness. So photosynthesis would be like impossible. And um, but conditions have remained really stable over time. So maybe, maybe some things could live there. So that's the old school of thought. Obviously now it's known that there's a lot of living things there and we're gonna talk about those things. This is a really cool video by Living Attractions, Mariana Trench, David Attenborough's documentary on the deepest sea floor that I do recommend checking out because it's really cool. So with deep sea animals, they have so many weird adaptations that help them to survive this. Uh, and here's different pictures of different organisms and some of them we will talk about today. But one of them that caught my attention was this tripod fish. And here's a video from EV Nautilus where they had a submersible that they took down and found a tripod fish in predation stance. And pretty much this guy just like stands on the bottom with its three projections from its fins sticking out and it waits for something to move or pass it by. So it's expelling almost no energy waiting, and then it waits for something to pass by, and then it'll go and grab it um, and, and eat it really quickly. So here's some different adaptations that organisms have. One of them to deal with the pressure is that a lot of organisms have a tissue pressure that matches the pressure of the seawater. So a lot of organisms are like a squid type of body where they don't, they're kind of equal pressure to the water around them. Another adaptation they have for the cold is that a lot of organisms have adapted to be able to survive in such extreme cold by slowing their metabolism so they're not um, respirating as fast and they lower their metabolic rate um, as a consequence. So they don't need to eat as much food. When you're almost like living on ice, you don't need as much food if you are the same temperature as your surroundings. So this is a cool video by Science ABC2, how do deep sea fish survive the extreme pressure? That's kind of cool and you can check it out. Um, this slide has the lovely hatchet fish species that is shown here. Um, I, this slide is about um, color in deep sea organisms. A lot of the organisms that are down there are surprisingly still counter shaded, meaning they're darker on top and lighter on the bottom so that if you look at them from the top, they're hidden. But if you're looking up to the sunlight above, they look light on the bottom and matches the light above. But that doesn't even seem to be necessary down here where it's completely dark. That could be a relic left over evolutionarily. However, a lot of these organisms will actually travel to higher waters during the day or during the night to feed and then return back to the deep at other parts of the day. A lot of these organisms have photophores to give off light and coloring wise, most species tend to be red, like bright red or orange, but there's other colors too, like iridescent or black or brown on a lot of these species. 
So one of the coolest thing is bioluminescence and tons and tons of organisms have bioluminescence. So this is the ability to, for animals to make their own light. And some of these animals actually have organs that will luminesce for them and make their own light. Whereas others actually have a bacteria that they have a relationship with and the bacteria will do it. So how some of these, this fish is actually, by the way, a vampire fish is right in these pictures and it looks pretty darn terrifying. Um, these, the organisms that are doing this with a bacteria, one study seemed to show that the organism would say it's a fish that has the bacteria that will light up. The fish will actually deprive the bacteria of oxygen until they're attacked or they want to find a mate or otherwise use their light. And then when they want to use their light, they'll flush the bacteria with some oxygen and let the bacteria breathe for a second. And the bacteria gets excited and lights up and the fish gets, you know, their, their light turned on for them by just giving them a little bit of oxygen. Um, even more interesting to me though, is the organisms that can bioluminesce using their own bodies and are not relying on bacteria to do this. So certain species have luciferin, which is a protein that ends up combining with oxygen using a, an enzyme called luciferase and ATP. And then basically that ATP energy, which is the energy molecule that all of us use. And it's, it's like a rechargeable battery where it just fills up and then it gets used up, but it, that rechargeable battery only lasts a few seconds. So that ATP will actually convert its energy to light, but a light with almost no heat loss. So it does a flash of light and puts all the energy towards the light and not really any towards heat. And that light can be blue green or red or yellow, but it's really cool. And then of course we already talked about how a number of these are also counter shaded. So why do different organisms um, luminesce at all or light up at all? Well, here's some closely related fish here that are all um, very closely related species, but you can see that they light up in different ways. And one of the way, ways this is used is for species, identif species identification, but also for finding a mate. Since these are all closely related species, because their light patterns are different, they're not going to get confused and attempt or even try to mate with an organism of a close relative instead of their own species. So the light kind of gives them a specific pattern to recognize underneath the water. They'll also use it to attract prey or to illuminate prey. Like lanternfish will actually turn on their ventral lights. That means the lower half stomach lights um, to see if there's any little like copepods or things beneath them that they can grab up and snatch and eat really quickly. Um, other organisms are actually using this as defense, like some squid can release a cloud of light, some fish, like right here you see on the video, this is an awesome video by National Geographic Bioluminescence on Camera that shows some fish releasing puffs of light that they, they throw out a cloud or puff of light or squid do it too in this video. And they can use that to do whatever they need to do to confuse a predator or find prey. Um, it's just a really cool adaptation. So for seeing in the dark, um, a lot of uh, fish will have tubular eyes and many of them have two retinas. So there'll be one retina that is collecting um, light from far away objects and one retina back here that is collecting light from close objects. And the reason why fish would want to differentiate is down there, there's so little food that you can't waste energy trying to go after something that's far away. And depth perception in the complete darkness with light is going to be really difficult. So it has two different retinas that will help detect, is this a close light or is this a far away light? Should I expend my energy trying to capture this prey or not? And so they have two different retinas for that. This is actually a video by Embari, new deep sea sighting. The barrel eye fish has a transparent head and a tubular eyes. And we'll explain that a little bit more. 
but a lot of organisms just have only slightly functional eyes or are totally blind and they're really relying more on touch or different um, chemicals in order to find prey. So in finding mates in the dark, one of the organisms is the ang anglerfish. It's hard to date in total darkness like that and find your same species and there's not many of them around. And the anglerfish might have one of the most bizarre um, mating experiences um, that I can think of. So this is a video from Deep Marine Seeds, the anglerfish, and video from Science Magazine, first footage of deep sea anglerfish pair, a pair of them together. So when the female, and this is a female in the GIF, um, goes and finds a male, the male is very, very, very tiny compared to the female. And he will actually permanently attach and glue himself onto the female. And then once he does, he almost becomes like a parasite where he just permanently has fused to her body and he'll actually reduce his whole body functions so that he is nothing more in the end than a pair of testicles that are attached to her. And then when he needs to release sperm for mating, the, the testicles will release the sperm, but he is permanently adjoined to her forever um, for as like a mating experience. It's just so bizarre. Um, so there's a couple videos that show some of that. So the finding food in the dark is also really difficult. A lot eat, will eat detritus like dead and decaying organisms. Some migrate upward at night to go and feed. A lot have really large mouths so they can just grab whatever is there really quick. And remember that a lot of fish don't chew because they want the food to get past their gills really fast so they can continue breathing. So they just are not chewing or anything. They're just taking it straight into their stomachs but they have these massive teeth for grabbing the prey so it won't get away, expandable stomachs, and then very short, small tails for swimming because they can't go long distances and waste a lot of energy. So um, here is a few videos from Evie Nautilus. A gulper eel balloons its massive jaws. So this is a submersible video that's only, you know, a few seconds to a minute long that they actually have this this organism called a gulper eel, and this is all the length of its mouth right here, that it opens its mouth bigger than anything you've seen in this video. Um, it's cool to watch. And here's a video from Deep Marine Scenes that explains the organism more, but this is the live feed from the submersible of what this looks like. But there's different ways of finding food in the in the dark, like the stomatoids, which have barbells, like like this um, sea dragon um, here that'll have this barbell to kind of comb around and feel for food that it can go for. Anglerfish obviously have a projection on it that lights up and glows and you try to lure in the other fish. Um, the deep sea animals, many of them are small, but some of them are massively large. Like this is how big isopods can get on the seafloor. Like, like over a foot large. Um, there's also like giant squid that can get 30 to 50 feet. And, and little is actually known about some of these organisms. Um, this is actually a GIF right here. But above that is a video by AFP News Agency. Japan divers capture rare footage of a live giant squid. Some, some divers were just diving at, you know, just barely under the surface of the water. And a giant squid from the deep probably going to die based on how it's like sloughing off its skin, but it came up to swim right next to them and larger than the divers. It's totally interesting and I recommend checking it out. This is just a quick little video here, but there's also this video by National Geographic Wild, um, Squid and the Deep Sea Devils. Um, so it there's just a lot to learn about these and one new species of deep water squid is called the big fin squid i say it's new because it was only discovered in 1988 and it has these longer arms it barely even looks like a squid some people would think jellyfish or something here um i've heard some people think it looks more like an octo or something but it's actually a type of squid here's a video where it's sending down its its like arms to be 
or tentacles to, to act almost like puppet strings that it's using. And on the end of these strings, it actually has uh, sticky strings instead of suckers. Um, it also has different behavior than other squid in that other squids will like shoot an ink in your face and then swim away. So it's, it's just a huge distraction just trying to get out of the ink and they're long gone. These guys will like actually squirt their ink and then go hide in the ink and hope that you just move on and just go away. Um, there's also some organisms down there that are considered relics that um, they've been around for like millions and millions of years on our planet and just chilling down there, hanging out and have remained fairly unchanged. So the spiru, spiru, spirula, um, which are these guys here, it's actually this little guy here. This is a video by Ben G. Thomas on spirula, animal of the week. And inside they have these really cool air chambers like a Nautilus has that will help them to float because these are kind of really dense little guys. Um, and so it's cool to look at them. Another one that has remained very unchanged, um, there's a video by Mbari, what vampire squid really eats. These vampire squids, um, they're, they actually eat marine snow, which if you remember, that's just like floating particulate in the water, or sometimes it's like a bubble of mucus that another animal has released to collect bacteria and tiny little microscopic creatures in the water. And so it's either these like mucus bubbles or this just particulate floating in the water. That is what the vampire squid eats. So it's kind of a terrifying name for something that eats something that none of us want. Um, but if you look at its projection, it's in between the tentacles, it's kind of bat-like. So I think that's where it got its name. Other relics from the deep are like the coelacanth. This is a fish that is highly, highly, highly endangered. It only lives in a couple places left in the world, but um, it has been unchanged in the fossil record for 70 million years. And really cool, its fins in the back actually um, act and look like full legs that can like move forward and do almost like a walking forward action, which thing makes um, evolutionary bi biologists think it's related to tetrapods or early four legged, um, like four appendage types of animals. So there's also the Neopolina, which is this uh, limpet like mollusk. It is a mollusk, not a limpet. And they think it was maybe the ancestor to different bivalves like clams or gastropods or cephalopods, but it was thought to be extinct 350 million years ago till they found it in the 1952. Um, but can you imagine being on earth fairly unchanged for 350 million years? It's really crazy. So this is a video by Natural World Facts, the coelacanths living fossils of the sea. That's pretty cool if you want to check it out. Um, so at the bottom of the sea, uh, how do you get food? Like diving into that a little bit deeper and looking at that because the normal food chain, like photosynthesizing organisms are not existing down there. So where is the food even coming from? Well, in a very disgusting way, um, the food is a, is 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 just really gross um, a lot of it is organic matter that rains down from the surface in the form of feces like um, the fecal matter the poo from other organisms falling down has some nutrients left and is eaten down below carcasses so dead and decaying organisms that fall down and then the marine snow which we've already talked about can be like mucus bubbles or particulate of of in the water. So here's a video from BBC Earth, uh, whale fall in Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. This is a dead whale carcass that a submersible found and they go back and they revisit it um, a year later and organisms are still feeding on that same carcass a year and a half later. It's really, really cool. Um, but they, they believe 
that some whale carcasses feed a community down there for actual for years for for years it will get eaten so this is a video of a whale carcass over time that you can kind of see and then here's a video by noah sanctuaries whale fall in monterey bay national marine sanctuary that you can also check out okay so at the bottom of the sea um bacteria bacteria tend to do fine in many conditions um so the bacteria are consumed by the myofauna which are the small small worms or the foramens like here uh, these are tiny microscopic shelled organisms that will feed on bacteria so bacteria get feed on very very tiny worms and these tiny microscopic shelled organisms and then those guys are eaten by larger things like bivalves like clams and filter feeders that are going to filter those things out of the water or larger worms and then those bivalves and larger worms are then fed on by predators like fish or squid or sea stars so that's kind of what a food web or food chain looks like down there separate though there's a certain group of organisms that are deposit feeders that will eat um, clean out the soil and mud below and look for anything that is left over in that and that is what they will eat or their suspension feeders where they will just try to filter stuff out of the water these are like sea cucumbers or brittle stars or urchins um, down here in the mid ocean trenches this is where one giant plate is subducting or going underneath another plate so these are the mid-ocean trenches because there's active geologic activity happening there um, and it's the deepest areas so far scientists haven't found a whole lot of life there it's been very very rare in the future they might find more but that's one of the spaces where they haven't found much of anything yet at this point so in these deepest parts of the oceans in general there are very few organisms as you're as like scientists are moving a submersible around and looking for organisms it's rare to find anything at all but crazy even though there's a low number of actual organisms the diversity is really really high so you'll run into a fish like a maybe a hagfish then you know maybe an anglerfish then you're running into an octo then you're maybe running into a brittle star so very high diversity in what you're running into even though it's not often that you run into an organism so how did the diversity stay so high there's basically two different thoughts on this one thought is that a lot of these organisms have a hard time spreading their babies around so basically in one little limited space there's a lot of like kind of family type of inbreeding between the individuals and even though over thousands of years there was another group of those individuals a couple miles away who are also inbreeding over time maybe the genes of one family are just slightly different from that other family that in, that they become you know separated and isolated and become two different species so that's one train of thought another thought is just the fact that a lot of these organisms have been around like this one the neopolina has been here for 350 million years and over that large geologic time um, after there's been 350 million years there's just been the accumulation of a lot of different species that have survived and there's a lot of differences so that is the other school of thought that just due to the time and the fact that the environment hasn't changed much that a lot of different species have accumulated if you are interested in seeing a bunch of different species um, deep marine seas has a playlist and i attached it here of like 160 different animals and i'm sure they're always adding to it of um, deep animals um, also interesting about this on one of the whale carcass videos that i attached they actually found something like eating the one whale carcass and on a submersible using only robotics and people didn't go down there and actually get to dig in and see what's there they found something like over 170 different species just on one whale carcass 
different species on one carcass. That it's crazy. Um, but anyways, this playlist goes over lots of different animals. And this was one from Deep Marine Scenes on the giant Pacific octopus that I attached, but there's like hundreds of them that they've done. Okay, so there's also vent communities like hydrothermal vents, which are so cool and so unique and really exciting um, that places like this exist. They're very self-productive and they make a lot of they make a whole like ecosystem habitat right around these. So specifically, these are areas where there's a like a fissure in the water and the ocean water is coming in contact with magma, lava, like magma that is deep below the surface. And that superheats the water right there. And when I say superheats, some of the like white smokers end up being ones that release a white smoke can be 300 degrees C or 572 degrees Fahrenheit. That hot is how much they are heating the water there. Or black smokers um, that release a black smoke like the one here in this GIF, they'll be 300 to 450 degrees C or up to 842 degrees Fahrenheit. That's really, really, really hot. So these are areas where there is like spreading usually in the in the plates and in, in different boundaries. And so the water will go down and touch touch those spaces. The white smokers that are releasing a white like water the white will actually come, the water will actually come out white because it's releasing, it's full of zinc sulfide. But the black smokers, they actually appear more like a black smoke because they actually have copper sulfide precipitate in the water. So the water comes out clear, but it appears black due to that participate precipitate. So you can look at this video by Ambari, Hydrothermal Vents, Explore a Bizarre Deep Ocean Habitat. And then here's another look at vent communities. The sulfide that comes out would normally be completely poisonous and would kill most organisms, but there is a bacteria that has learned to handle that. And then when bacteria can digest it, something comes along and eats the bacteria and it makes a whole food chain. So this bacteria was actually first identified by a college student who was listening to a lecture on this and was like, I know how this is happening. It must be bacteria. So this is a really cool video that explains that. It's um, called I Contain Multitudes, How Giant tube worms survive the hydrothermal vents. Um, and I totally recommend looking at it. It was a really cool process. So these tube worms that will live off of the bacteria that they filtered, um, they can be up to six feet tall. And so that's why there's a human like body jumping out there, not, not just to haunt you, um, but to show you like how tall these actually are and give you some perspective. So Clams, mussels, anemones, barnacles, limpets, crabs, worms, fish, they all live around these spaces and the bacteria are the basis of that food chain and then other primary consumers eat them. And then some of the clams, mussels, and worms will actually host and hold in their bodies the chemosynthetic bacteria that can digest these chemicals and they'll have it in their body to, to give them extra energy. So also very interesting, the vent communities here are letting off their own light. So there is a long wavelength range um, light, a visible light that is radiating from these vents. And some organisms down there will actually have a reflective spot in their, in their eyes that can pick up on that light. Um, sadly, these organisms or these communities are not permanent. These ecosystems do have a rise and fall that as soon as that deep magma cools and that fissure stops producing that heat, um, this whole community will fall. And the organisms to respond to that will release a ton of larvae, have tons and tons of babies in hopes that one of those babies finds a new fissure somewhere. Um, nearby, which there will be hot spots of these where they'll be pretty frequent, but they'll release a lot of larva babies in hopes that one or two survive to find another fisher and carry the genes um, forward. 
they also have found that some of these organisms after the fall of the of this ecosystem they will actually reside on some marine carcasses for a while to hold them op over until a new um, hydrothermal vent opens up so crazy different adaptations there and this is actually a gif that shows one crab eating some of this bacteria off of another crab so the other there they go that's how they're surviving so that's our video on life at the ocean's depths and i hoped i hope you learned a lot of new things in that